uh, student that we study from CU. So I'm Amanda Hayes, this is Debbie Crawford and Linda Smith. And we're here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we're meeting at First Unitarian Universalist Church, um, but it's uh, we're sort of uh, with uh, the the people just uh, connected with the People's Justice Project as well. Um, and some of us are church members, some of us not, but we're all in this. Um, how about Alice Diebel? Hi, I'm Alice Diebel with Miami Valley Fellowship in Dayton, Ohio. And I will pick Harvey. There are two Harveys, but Harvey, you're muted now. Hi there, I'm Harvey Harrison, First Unitarian in Des Moines. And my comrade here is David Cohen. Oh, hiding around the corner. Oh, hi, David Cohen. <laughs> Can you pick someone else? We're it. Oh, good. Good. Thanks, Kevin. I'm Kevin Jago. I'm one of the Church of the Larger Fellowship Learning Fellows. I'm based currently in Brooklyn, New York. And I will call on Catherine. Uh, hi. I'm <laughs> okay. Ow, that hurt. Are you okay? Yeah. There are, there are two computers in the room. There are three of us here from First Unitarian Church in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I'll call on the other two in their computer, and that's Dana. Dana, you are currently muted, which is good that you were muted while Catherine was talking. Okay. Um, you might have to turn off your. Well, turn off your sound. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You got it. Okay. Yes. So. I'm Dana Buell from First Unitarian Portland. And I'm Barbara Dow, also from First Unitarian. And we pick whoever else hasn't gone, because we can't see all the people yet. Uh, Jennifer Tracy hasn't gone. Hi, I'm also from First Unitarian in Portland, although I now live in Vancouver, Washington. So um, that's my baby and my husband. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and is there anyone else that hasn't gone? Lynn Buffington from, is it Miami Valley as well? Lynn, you're on mute. Okay, now I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, this is me, Lynn Buffington from Miami Valley UU. Hi, Lynn. Great, thank you. And then we have the conference room here in Cincinnati. So um, before they start up, Kevin, is there any techie stuff you want to say to people? Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, for those folks that are in the same room, and I think it's first of Portland, you might want to pick a group to be the, the mic so that we don't uh, keep blowing out people's ears. Just pick which computer and then have people go to that computer to to unmute. Um, and then one other thing is at the bottom of the screen is the chat box, which is already happening. Uh, people talking about halos and such. Uh, so at the bottom, the bottom center, you can click on chat and you'll be able to see any conversations that happen there. We sometimes use that to ask questions, that sort of thing. And then uh, the lower left is your mute and unmute button if you're on a computer. Um, and as well as your stop video and play video. Um, the other thing that I want to let people know is that, like all of the previous sessions, we are recording this one, just so people are aware that they are being recorded. We are sharing it only with participants in this group so far, so that's where they'll, but they'll be in the, what is it, the Google Drive folder that I send email links to. And I think that's it for me.
Thanks so much, Kevin. As usual, I'll read a poem and turn it over to uh, the conference room there, Alan Adam Gerhardstein. This one is Naomi Shihab Nye's poem, Cross That Line. And I thought of it because I feel like this work that we're doing is about crossing all kinds of lines. Cross that line. Paul Robeson stood on the northern border of the USA and sang into Canada, where a vast audience sat on folding chairs waiting to hear him. He sang into Canada. His voice left the USA when his body was not allowed to cross that line. Remind us again, brave friend, what countries may we sing into? What lines should we all be crossing? What songs travel toward us from far away in our days? Thank you so much for being here and crossing all these lines. Alan Adam, it's yours. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've been at this now uh, through three sessions, and this is our fourth. Uh, as you recall, in our first session, we um, began the process of mapping and understanding our local police departments, uh, which is work that's been ongoing for um, your groups. And we started talking about community partnership and uh, uh, how to achieve change in, um, with lots of teammates. And, um, and at the last session, when we were transitioning to sort of strategic planning and thinking about the projects we're going to do, uh, it became clear that um, that these groups wanted to uh, have an ongoing relationship, and we were moving a little fast, and we needed to slow down and work with folks uh, where they are. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about and get to in the second half of this webinar. But first, we have a special guest. Uh, once again, and my dad will introduce her, and, uh, and we'll have a bit of a dialogue and then some opportunities to ask questions. So, good afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we have Ebony Ruland with us. She's a professor at the University of Cincinnati School of Criminal Justice, and she is an expert, as she will explain herself, in community engagement around police reform. So, you've heard from Iris Rowley, who was uh, and is... Uh, our partner in Cincinnati is an activist and uh, ongoing force for uh, change in policing in Cincinnati. And then you heard from Maris Harold, who is a chief of police for the University of Cincinnati Police Department and represents uh, the type of policing that maybe we all want to aspire to. And now we want to circle back to the challenge, especially that was posed to us by the Cleveland group last time, of how do you find the best partners for this work? How do you support them and, and collaborate effectively? Um, and what are the resources that are out there? Our own website and the Police Reform Toolkit will continually be updated. Well, we did get some information from Maris that has been added to it. Uh, and I know that Ebony will probably have a couple things that she might add to it. Uh, but let's, let's hear about this type of person, a person who, whose job it is uh, to do community engagement and uh, learn. Thanks. So, yeah, so I do um, community um, engagement in my focus is really on bridging police and community relationships. And so I do that by focusing both on community and the police. Because a lot of times groups will focus on just the community or just the police, but it's really important to understand both perspectives. Because as we know, many communities um, don't trust the police, but police also don't trust the community. And so if we don't understand both perspectives and try to look at ways to bridge that perspective, we're not going to have long-lasting um, sustainable changes. And so um, my work has previously been done in Minnesota. So I've worked with uh, departments in Minneapolis looking at racial disparities in traffic stops and searches. I've done work to look at uh, low-level offense arrests in certain communities. And then most recently, I did a study um, looking at drivers of crime in hotspot areas and how um, why those crimes exist in hotspot areas and how 
um, the community sort of feels about that in terms of the policing, and then what, how does policing um, sort of exacerbate or um, affect the crime in hotspot areas? And then currently I'm working with um, Cincinnati Police on a new project as well, looking at um, community problem oriented policing. So that's just a little bit of background about me and how I look at this issue. So I don't know if you have any direct questions or want to know specific yeah, things. So you kind of have the picture of what these groups are trying to do and they want to be uh, effective. They want to be pointing and pushing community and police toward uh, models that reduce the number of arrests, that reduce the use of force, that hold people accountable, uh, but that promote safety. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the practical uh, pieces of advice you have to folks like this? Yes, I think it's really important to define, to start off defining community, um, because oftentimes we use the word community, but community means different things. So there's, um, and, and policing happens differently in certain communities. So we have to be able to define what is the community that we want to address? Um, and then within that, what is the problem that we want to address? Um, so I focus mostly on um, race, well, not even racially diverse, I was gonna say racially diverse low income communities, but I will say African, African American um, low income communities that traditionally do have um, higher levels of crime compared to other communities. So with that definition, the problem is a little bit different um, than if I was, you know, a predominantly white suburban community. Um, so again, I think the best advice is to define the community and then within that define the problem and understand the complexities of the problem um, because like my work in North Minneapolis, which is a, a African American um, community that experiences disproportionate amounts of crime. So the neighbors want the crime to stop in that community. It's not that they don't want a police presence in that community, they just want police to utilize different tactics. So it's not enough to say like, oh, we need to do away with police or you know, police are the enemy. No, that's not what we're saying. They're saying we want police to do practices differently. So that's why it's very important to understand or to define the community and then to define the problem because that will then ultimately define the solutions. So a lot of the groups that we're working with do want to connect with African-American communities who feel over-policed, who have been on the front lines protesting and uh, supporting Black Lives Matter. How, what advice do you have for effective connection with that group? I think really listening to those groups um, and going and, and forming a partnership with those groups. So not coming in and saying, you know, we know what you want or we know what's best. Um, because like even for me, I don't come from those communities, so I can't speak necessarily about what the community wants, but I can partner with the community and I can utilize my resources, my connections, my voice to help uh, remedy what the community wants. And then also understanding the community. Um, sometimes you'll hear like on the media, well, if they just would have pulled over, um, or listen to the police officer, and then they would have got shot. You know, if they, you know, if they, I don't understand, they don't have anything to hide, so why wouldn't you want to stop? But understanding that the system, understanding that people are policed differently, understanding that people are harassed um, by the police, understanding that it is a tactic that police use. I mean, they're open in that, um, for instance, in Minneapolis, uh, they use what is called code four, and it comes out of New York, which is called Comstock. And, and it really is to use traffic stops to find bigger things. So if somebody does a, if there's a sign that says no turn on red, or they forget to use their blinker, that is enough reason to pull over and to search. Um, but again, those police tactics aren't used in other suburban areas. Um, so I think understanding that there are differences and that these aren't just people perceptions and that people aren't making it up. Um, so really hearing people's stories and then again, partnering with people so that they can tell their stories um, and that we can be allies, but not necessarily, you know, the voice taking it over. One of the uh, premises that we thought we laid here was that there are skills 
that are common in the Unitarian communities uh, that could be very valuable to these partnerships. And some of that might be uh, data familiarity, use of spreadsheets, uh, collecting and then analyzing. And you were talking about studies you've done on uh, disparities in arrests and traffic stops. What advice do you have about how to even tackle that topic? Yes, I think um, most police departments, most large police departments have really good data on their website. Um, so, you know, I would start there on a very basic level uh, because you can just get, um, I know with Cincinnati and Minneapolis, the two that I'm more familiar with, um, there's a ton of data on their website. You can actually drill down even by neighborhood, by race, by types of crime. Um, but then it can't stop there. Then, it, then you definitely, um, if you're, if you're interested, uh, I would do a request and pull the actual and get the actual data files, the Excel data or whatever format they have it in, because that website data is only going to tell us some basic cursory stuff. But if we really want to uh, begin to peel the onion, then we need the whole data set. I wouldn't expect um, necessarily, you know, just average people who don't have statistics to do this, but maybe finding somebody who you can partner with. Um, at a uh, university or even students who are, you know, interested in this topic that could do this and begin to peel the layers of that to look at um, more of the reasons why these stops or arrests are occurring. So you, you told us a little bit about how to connect with the community. What about the police side? Um, your whole mission may be one that police don't feel a need for or feel threatened by, um, how's it going? Yes, it's absolutely crucial to partner with the police. And uh, it's important to not go in there with an agenda. Um, oftentimes when I go into working with the police departments, you know, I'll start by tell me what your issues are. Tell me what your issues are with the community. Because um, as I mentioned earlier, they, they have issues with the community too. They don't trust them or they you know, feel like they're doing all that they can. They feel like they're under-resourced. Um, so it's important to go in, not with an agenda, um, but then ask them what their, what their concerns are and find ways that you can bridge the community's concerns with the police concerns. Um, and again, it's so crucial to have the police at the table from the start because I was working on a project um, in Minnesota where there was an officer involved shooting and um, they were doing all this great stuff. It was the community group, city council, everybody was doing all this great stuff. And I said, where are the police? And they said, well, we'll bring the police in once we figure out what we want to do. Well, you have absolutely no buy-in at that point. There is no incentive. There's no reason why police would want to be involved in something like that. And police, quite frankly, don't want to be told what to do. Um, so you have to, you have to incorporate the police from the get-go, is my feeling. So, and what, how do you do that when you have these relationships between the community and the police that are so loaded and uh, everybody's at arm's length and you're coming in as, you know, sort of a, a white congregation, partnering community, how do you uh, start building bridges? Yeah, so I think, again, not going in with the agenda about we want to improve police community relationships or, you know, we think police are racist and we want to you know, help you solve this problem. I mean, that's going to shut the door right then and there. So you have to go in um, with a true open mind, with a true um, idea that this is going to be a partnership. And then I really do think that for the most part, officers at the top get it. They want to see it differently. Um, like the police chiefs, the deputy chiefs, the commanders, um, they, they are more visionaries and it's just better off for them if everybody can get along and, you know, from a public relations side. Um, and then I think there's some people even at the um, entry level, so parole, patrol officers and stuff, who I think do want to see things um, differently. But when we go in with these extremes that, like, police are bad or community bad, then I, you know, that's what makes them automatically defensive. So I do think that for the most part, police do want to see changes. Now, again, you have those that don't, um, but that's, that's, I guess, the same with community. There's some community members that don't want to improve relationships either. So I think, I think they're open to it if you go in the right way. So 
are you the only professor in America that has this job? Or are there colleagues out there that actually, uh, that you can relate to and work with? No, there's definitely colleagues out there. There's a lot of people doing this work. There's a lot, um, there's, um, I'm blanking on her name, so I'm not even gonna say her name, um, but she's at Michigan State. She's um, doing some great work uh, around Ferguson right now, police team in Ferguson. Um, I know Michelle Phelps at the University of Minnesota is doing some work on uh, policing um, as well. There's just people all over, and I can't I can't think of names off the top of my head. Um, well, I don't want to get names wrong, but there's people all over doing this great work. But if any of the uh, members of this webinar want, want to seek out an ebony in their neck of the woods, maybe we can help them do that? Yes, definitely. Okay. All right. And there's a report that, um, the, I don't know if it was the DOJ, but it was some arm of the federal government that um, before Obama um, term was up, that brought together people in Minnesota that did this work in policing and brought people from all over the country. And that's a great report that was just released. Um, and those are really the who's who um, of the people who are doing this police and community work. So I'll make sure, the report is public, I believe, um, but I'll make sure you guys get a copy of that report okay. post on your website. All right, this isn't, you know, not the 21st century. It's a, it comes out of the 21st century policing, um, and it's looking at how police agencies and how community groups are sort of implementing the 21st century. Okay, we have a few minutes with somebody who's an expert in police community relations. Uh, the consulting fee is free. Uh, we're open for questions. I have one. This is Alice. Um, you mentioned the hotspots issue, and Dayton has recently started that kind of policing, looking at particular hotspots and um, increasing the police presence there and I was you mentioned that you had some research on how that works well and not and I wonder if you could talk about that yeah so I don't think hotspots policing does work well I mean I don't support hotspots policing but I know that policing agencies do support hotspots policing um, and actually Corey Haberman who's at the University of Cincinnati in the School of Criminal Justice I believe is partnering with Dayton on that so that might be another professor um, who you might want to email, and I'd be happy to connect. We're working together on this um, Cincinnati project. I have a question, Debbie Crawford in uh, Columbus. We requested and got self-initiated traffic stops by the race and gender of the person that was stopped. We found that 50%, that's 50% of the people being pulled over uh, were African-American males. And when I discussed this with some of the people that, you know, some of the police people, they said, well, of course, because those areas are high crime areas and we police those more. That's why we pull those people over more. And um, how do you respond when they say that this is not a disproportionate share of the population to be pulled over? I, I did a, a comparison figure with the Ohio Highway Patrol and 13 or 11 percent of the people they pull over are African Americans as opposed to Columbus police. So right. what's your response when somebody says, well of course it's higher because we police those areas more. Right and that's exactly the problem with hot spots policing because um, if you go to the suburban areas and pull people over too, you'll probably get that same figure of people who are doing um, you know illegal activities but it's that they're saturated in those um, areas. And so, uh, again, it's not that, we obviously want crime to decrease in those areas, and we, um, the residents obviously want crime to dis decrease in those areas too, but it's the tactics that police are using. And, and those tactics of arresting people and using traffic stops and searches is actually not decreasing crime. Um, research shows that it just the point, you know, it moves it to the next area within that that neighborhood. It doesn't actually decrease it. Um, so the the practices that they're using are ineffective, um, and they need to do practices that are rooted in evidence based. And one of those is the community problem oriented policing um, that shows promising uh, results to reducing crime. So it's just. That we hear that all the time, we, you know, that they're just responding to calls for service or that's where the crime's um, occurring. But what I would say back to them is it's not 
they're, they're not doing anything to reduce it. They're just responding to it. So just to follow up for her though, for, for Debbie Crawford, so she just got this answer. You disagree with the answer. What's a constructive way for her to press and to take it to another level? Um, I think being rooted in the literature around community problem-oriented policing, so you could throw it back to them and say, you know, well, the tactic that you're using is not effective at reducing crime. Um, you know, you're just responding to it, but you're not actually addressing it. Here's, enough, here's one way that has been shown to be effective at reducing crime and really gets to the root of that. And the other thing that's neat about community problem-oriented policing, it doesn't all just fall on the police um, because a lot of times, they can't, I mean, that, that is their job, is to respond to crime, uh, but they can't necessarily, um, we have to look to other places to eliminate the crime. So that's, I guess, what I would say back to them. And would you have a citation that you might be willing to give Alan and Adam that we could say, look at this, this, this heavy um, pulling over people is not effective. Do you have a citation for that so we can cite it as a research-based um, strategy? Yeah, there's definitely some, uh, there's a lot of research on there, so I'll just have to figure out what the best one is. And sometimes they can get a little academic-y and you can lose officers very quickly with that. So I'll have to just do a little search on what the best citation would be, but I'll definitely provide that. Thank you. I'd be willing to pay extra on your consulting fee today. Yeah, well, <laughs> she's only got half a glass of water. I might fill it if, if it's, you know. Or sparkly water. Yeah, or yeah, sparkly water, right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. This is Jennifer. I had a question. Um, so I, I appreciate the, you know, the uh, perspective of working, you know, bring, having police in the room to kind of make sure that the solutions you're coming up with, that they're bought into those solutions. Um, and in the meetings, or like, you know, some of the community meetings I've been to that include police officers, I was really surprised by um, the way that they feel like they are victims, they are being persecuted by the public, you know, turning against them. Um, they don't see that the, because they have so much power in the sense of like the rule, the rule, the law is on their side and they carry a gun, but they don't see that they have an obligation to use that power fairly. Um, how do you kind of talk to, do you have to find someone who has a better perspective in order to work with them? Or how do you address that perspective where the police really want everyone to just be on their side no matter what? Um, to get them to actually look at and address the problems that are within police culture and the ways that the police unions and police rules have been set up in the favor of police over, you know, the, the human lives that are being um, negatively impacted. Yeah, that's a good question. And that's like really, I mean, that what you've addressed is kind of what my research is trying to get at more. Um, because I think that the police union is critical and you have to it's good to get the police union um, to be supportive of whatever action you're trying to take, but that's very difficult because of the systemic um, ways in which we've set up police. And I don't know where this has come from that, you know, because police are still respected and police do have a, a big job, but it doesn't mean that they're not worthy of critique. And so I don't know where we've lost that just because we critique officers, you know, that it's, you know, that this idea that we're against them because, you know, people will say I'm pro-police and I just cannot stand that because what does that even mean? Of, of course we need um, policing, but th they, there is room for improvement. So, I mean, I think it's a tough question that you're, you ask. So I think that, yes, you do need people who are supportive of whatever, of making it better on the committee. But also, I think that there has to be room for police officers to talk and say, you know, we feel like victims. We feel like um, nobody appreciates us and trusts us. Even if we don't believe that in our, in our mind, um, we have to give them space to talk, to, to say that. And community has to give the police officers space to um, talk and to, and to listen to how the police feel. But it's really important to have a good facilitator in the room when those types of things happen because that can spark and trigger a lot of emotions and reactions on both sides and then you just people leave the room frustrated and you never get anywhere but I would like to see those more honest conversations happen with the 
syndrome um, to increase their career. Can I ask a follow-up to that question? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned police unions then, because I, um, Jen was just talking about, we have a lot in Portland, a lot of community uh, police engagement, different activities that are happening, different groups. Um, but there's always the question of the union um, when it comes down to it around negotiations. So I'm wondering if you have any experience of successful engagement specifically of the union or does that just come through developing relationships with officers who then carry that message back to the union? Yeah, I don't have any success. I mean, when I talk to like chiefs about this, you know, they'll say, well, it stops with me, you know, so the union's secondary. Um, and there's a little bit of truth to that, but um, not really. I mean, the union is very, very powerful. So I don't have any success stories, but I think that's where I would like to see academic researchers go more, is to really um, try to get at this police union um, issue more. So I don't have a good answer for that, but I think it's something that we kind of not address very well in the research. Um, and I think it's an area where we definitely need to go further. Because, yeah, they can stop everything. And I, I, I can add to that, if you haven't already heard about it, Campaign Zero has a wonderful report with, I think, the top 40 or 50, maybe 100 cities in the country. Uh, most of them sent in their union contracts and Campaign Zero analyzed them and came up with the top 10, like eight to 10 union contract issues that do not hold police accountable. And it's a really great document. We, we used it to the, to the max. Our, our union contract right now is still in negotiation and it's over six months overdue to be renewed. So we're not holding up much hope, but the, the Campaign Zero website is filled with research-based strategies and policies. I have a question. Um, so you're a professor within the criminal justice program, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a lot of criminal justice programs at a lot of universities and colleges, probably in all of these cities. I encounter criminal justice programs usually on the resume of police officers and as it being sort of a pipeline towards being a police officer. But how can these folks partner with people within a criminal justice program, professors, students? I mean, where's the, is, it, is that a resource they can tap into? Yes, that's absolutely a resource um, that you can tap into. I know there's a lot of professors, as we um, said, that are doing this kind of work um, and are interested in, and unfortunately, uh, professors can sometimes run to whatever the hot issues are, and then they'll move to whatever the next hot issue is. Um, so policing is a hot issue right now, and so there's a lot of professors that are working on this issue um, and, and want to do something about it. So I hope it stays, because this is, I mean, this Black Lives Matter and um, Ferguson, I mean, this is nothing that's new. This has been going on. Uh, for decades and decades. Uh, and with cell phones now, they actually, you know, shed light on this. Uh, but this is not anything new, but the research is, you know, just starting to really come out about it. So I, I think that there is a lot of uh, professors that would be willing to partner, a lot of even um, staff with like um, different institutions within schools that are willing to partner. And then again, students. Now I will say a lot of students are, um, in criminal justice departments want to be police officers. Uh, so they have this, again, pro-policing that you critique and you're against them. But I think it's just really getting students to understand that you're not against police, but there's room to do better. Um, and so I think that'd be great opportunities for students to work with um, you guys as well. One of the things you said uh, is a bit of a challenge. You said that you should, you're most effective when you go into these settings without an agenda and you really want to you know listen to what the what's on the police mind um in my experience working with community groups they don't want a neutral they want an advocate and they they know that they are over policed and discriminated against and uh have too much force used against them and uh are not looking for somebody to just have no agenda right so how do you build faith with the with the targeted community group that you're trying to help 
while still you know, building a bridge to the police. Yes, yeah, so I think you can have an agenda, because I mean, even I have an agenda, but it's, it's about not pushing your agenda, it's about going in there um, and you can have your agenda, but set your agenda aside so that you can listen to the other side and not be so quick to push your agenda. And I think that, and I get that these are real issues for people. Um, you know, it's easy for me to say, you know, let's just go in there and listen to the police and, you know, let's not rock the boat too much. But for some people, these, this is really life or death. And so we have to understand that this is life and death and this is emotional for people. Um, and we all have a part to play. So there are some people who do have to be advocates. We do need Black Lives Matter out there um, protesting on the front lines, but we also need researchers collecting data so that we can have a response back to the police um, and tell them what does work. We need policymakers to change the law. So I'm not saying that there isn't a time to go in there and say, you know, enough's enough, but we have to determine like what role on the team do we want to play. I'm not one of those that's probably going to be on the highway protesting. I like to be more behind the, the um, scenes doing the research and, and making the policy changes. But it doesn't mean that we don't all have a part in this problem. And we don't doesn't mean that we don't have to hit it from different directions as well. Professor, I have another question if nobody else does. I feel like I've got a keeper here. Um, yesterday, the mayor um, had his third session of a community commission to study police in Columbus. And it was a, a show of what are police supposed to be doing in Columbus. And the activists in the room, if they weren't laughing, they were crying in terms of the, the protocols and what's supposed to happen. And they all knew it wasn't happening. Do you have a list of indicators, measures, that you say any good police department should be should be tracking these 10 indicators to you know to, to, to let the community know what's going on do you have a list like that or or can you point us to one yeah i don't i'm sure there's lists out there i don't can't think of one off the top of my head but that's really good i'm sure i'm sure there's lists out there um and it's sort of difficult to say like the top 10 um because Policing is so complex. And so I could see, you know, a top 10 in terms of responding to traffic stops, a top 10 in terms of use of force, a top 10 in responding to a crime. And so, um, but I'm sure there are still things out there that I can do a little digging on, but to sum summarize yeah. it in one point would might be difficult. Actually, on the website, on the, as part of our toolkit, there is such an article by Sam Walker. And he basically says, these are the healthy indicators of a, of a fair and equitable police department. Uh, so, and he's got to reduce to a manageable uh, set of criteria. So I recommend that to you. And it's already on our website in the, in the toolkit. I wanted to ask you, uh, you did some research around disparate policing. How'd that go? Do you have a, um, do you think things are better in Minneapolis as a result of the research you did and the work you partnered with the police on? So the statewide, um, so it was a statewide study. So we did um, many, many jurisdictions in Minnesota. I'm forgetting the exact number, but it was a multiple uh, jurisdiction study that looked at racial disparities in traffic stops and searches. And no surprise, um, African Americans. Uh, were stopped and searched um, greater than whites, but found contraband at less. Um, and so, uh, for whatever reason, the police were very defensive on that study. Um, they were, you know, they didn't buy the results. Again, we're just doing our jobs. Um, so, it caused a lot of um, tense relationships between uh, the police and the Council on Crime and Justice where I worked. Um, and I, I still don't, I don't know, I, I mean, I sort of get why the police would be defensive about it, but I sort of don't also get why they would be defensive because it's, you know, what an opportunity to look at our practices and procedures and do something differently. Uh, so, I don't know, it, just, it did cause a lot of tension. Realize what she just said, and this goes back to the question from Columbus about, you know, confronting them with the disparate traffic stops. The other part of that is to look at the hit rate. 
So you don't, you don't want to just know that more blacks have been stopped. You want them, you want to know how long people have been detained and whether they found any contraband. And as Ebony has said, we often see that the hit rate among the blacks that have been stopped is actually lower than the hit rate among the whites, which is totally explainable because they're using probable cause to stop the whites. So they probably do have a reason to think there might be some contraband. And they're using you know, racial prejudice to stop the blacks. So not that many people have contraband on them. And that's an important fact to carry forward as one of the basis for seeking this reform. Because it's not fair to stop people who aren't doing anything wrong. So, and that's a good indicator. And would, can we, when you say hit rate, we, we have this Excel file. It said whether or not the person was cited. It said whether or not the person was arrested. Um, would, would an arrest be equivalent to a hit? If they're arrested for um, taking a left turn or speeding, that's all within the traffic. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about searching for contraband and finding drugs or guns. And usually they will make a record of that. And usually blacks are detained longer because they're gonna do a more thorough search. And then, and then when they don't come up with something wrong, you understand why people are pissed off. And then also looking at, but with your question, looking at um, comparison data. So, you know, looking at um, either, I don't know if you have the whole city or if you have, if you just have a portion, but you want to look at an area that is predominantly white as well, because if African Americans are getting arrested for low level, like if I worked at the jail doing a study once and um, people are getting arrested for spitting on the sidewalk. Well, I can tell you who's getting arrested for spinning on the sidewalk, um, and I can tell you who's not getting arrested for spinning on the sidewalk. So you have to have some sort of comparison. Because yes, spinning on the sidewalk is illegal. It was illegal in Minneapolis. I think they now made it not illegal. But at the time, it was illegal. So we could say, well, they should have spit on the sidewalk. That's not the point. It's the point that the, the law is being applied uneven or unfairly. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Well, I just wanted to say how much many you threw into that and how appreciative I am of that. So thank you very much. Yeah, and I think Minneapolis uh, uh, is trying to do things better. And um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm recording, so I don't want to say too much, but yeah. <laughs> we can talk offline sometime. <laughs> Yeah, you might have some good advice for her um, next steps. So that would be yeah, that would be great. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And you're welcome to, to stay with us or not as you see fit. And uh, pipe up as, uh, as you want as well. No, I'm happy to help in any way. And uh, if you want to send my email out or whatever, okay. feel free to contact me. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. The check's in the mail, Professor. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, when Adam gets back, we will get to the to the next level. I hope that was helpful. Uh, we're trying to, in each of these sessions, present people who are themselves resources. So and and think about the fact that there are other people like this in various areas and look for them and ask Ebony for help finding them or ask uh, Chief Harold because uh, we want you to feel supported and, and have the support you need. So what's next, Adam? Could I ask a question about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we did yesterday um, had uh, Brian Renauer who works at uh, Portland State University come and talk with us about um, evidence-based policing and what that meant to him and got just some great perspective around um, you know, what, what makes evidence-based policing real or not. <laughs> and also even his, his own um, uh, understanding of what community uh, problem-solving policing looks like. Um, 
And one of the things that was a takeaway for me was hearing that, you know, they did a, a long-term study with the police um, that showed, similar to the hotspot policing um, and community policing uh, debate around whether or not more, um, more officers in certain randomized um, locations makes any difference to uh, the number of arrests or the decrease in um, in crime calls and showed basically it made no difference at all. Um, so there are some studies happening, but as I'm, we're still really grappling with where we're going to get our foothold. And um, I just lost the question that I <laughs> just went out of my mind. Um, hold on around community-based policing and, oh, so he, he talked a lot about that it, the departments, who, who the, the university partners with um, varies widely. And I'm not sure that the community groups are really making the bridges with, um, with the value of the data. Mm -hmm. um, and, it sounds like sometimes the police force itself is better using um, their research capacities, you know, than other times. So it just seems like it's this constantly shifting terrain around the science, the relationships to get things moving, you know, who's doing what. So I just share that a little bit of almost like the more we learn, the more confused I get. <laughs> about uh, I think it's the more you learn, the more questions you pose, which is not necessarily the same as confusion. Uh, because you can use data, for example, to identify uh, potential suspects and have a social web analysis of all the people out there who you think are likely to shoot at somebody. And then you can use that data and hound those people and wiretap and do things that are total violation of their civil rights. Or you can treat it respectfully and just notice that when one person in a social network uh, has committed a crime and you choose to keep an eye on the others, you might find that you can solve crimes quicker. So data can be used and abused uh, very easily. And if you never ask the question whether there's disparate enforcement, even though you have the data, that's a problem. Uh, so even people who have access to the data can um, squander it. And the police are doing a much better job of using it than community because we're all volunteers and it's hit and miss and we have to educate ourselves. But that's exactly well, why we're doing the webinar, that's, that's what we're trying to promote, is responsible use of the resources that are really out there and the partnerships that are out there. So I'm sure it'll sort out and you won't be confused. <laughs> Listen, Harvey, and I have a question for you. Um, I appreciate that she talked about building relationships with the police departments and the unions. In Des Moines, we've done that in several ways. Uh, through common programs that we've set up, for example, the Juvenile Court Diversion Program. It has not changed the response from the police department when we raise issues of disproportionality. The other thing, and I use that as a segue, as I've listened to you over the few times that I've heard you speak now, uh, my takeaway from it is that the city of Cincinnati and the state of Ohio got tired of being sued by you and that that was finally leverage enough to bring you to the table. Am I missing the point? Because we're starting a plan around that where we're actually, we've got a law firm that's now willing to take a look at litigation against the city, and we're working with the ACLU of Iowa to try to create, again, the legal leverage, and the, the theory being, if they won't come to the table for a reasonable conversation without that, let's create leverage that'll bring them to the table. Yeah, I think it depends on, you know, the nature of your department. Uh, as we've talked about before, we, we did need to file a class action lawsuit in order to get Cincinnati to shape up. And it was only after six years of court supervision 
that we had a group of leaders within the department who embraced it without feeling like they needed the court supervision anymore. Right. But even there, uh, after 10 years, we started to have slippage, and now we're in what we call a refresh. Uh, and without the club, it's a lot harder. Uh, so we're challenged there. Whereas, on the other hand, you heard from Maris Harrell, and the University of Cincinnati has done a much more comprehensive reform uh, with their police department uh, without court supervision than you know, we ever did with court supervision because they have leaders that really wanted to make that happen. Yeah. So yeah. Um, if you've got uh, police leadership that is fighting all the way and not open and you have the elements of good litigation, I certainly recommend the litigation as a way to get going. And then some of you are in consent decree cities uh, where you still have access to you know, the, uh, the community advisory committee and the monitors, and hopefully, you know, those are resources that you can use to, to help as well. Thanks. So um, this is, we're moving in the right direction. What uh, my goal was uh, for after our speaker was to, ask you all some questions. I think that the hope here that I've been hearing from folks is that this transforms into a supportive community, ongoing support as this work continues. And, um, and so what I'd like to do is for the groups that are here to give a little um, presentation uh, for where you're at and what you've done um, and what challenges you face, and we can sort of do a little coaching as uh, as you um, explain that. And hopefully that's beneficial to the other people on the, the webinar to a degree, and uh, yeah, we'll see how that works. So, who wants to jump in? Looks like Columbus. I say Columbus will start, and um, my uh, colleagues can chime in. Uh, we had from our activist leaders, African-American activist community leaders who've been working on this issue their whole lives. We had a set of priorities. Then the mayor's safety advisory committee started and they are short term. They're supposed to end in December and give recommendations to the mayor on how to improve police community re relations. So our shift has gone from kind of gathering data, generally learning to putting together a fact set of fact sheets that some of the commissioners can share with other commissioners because right now we believe the committee is really getting the dog and pony show about how wonderful the Columbus Police Department is and we want them to ask the right questions. So this seminar has given me ideas on the list of 20 questions that this commission should be asking of Columbus police in terms of their data. And I can't wait to those that toolkit that you just mentioned. I apologize for not knowing it was already on there. Uh, I'd say that's where we're at. And this, this, this unfortunately, this commission, we're, we're gonna try and get some sort of permanent body. The mayor is very good at having bodies on women's pay equity and different topics that are going to go on ad nauseum. But this one ends in December, sunsets in December. So, colleagues, anything else you want to throw in? I feel like you covered it. Okay, that's it. Yeah. So, what are you doing with the? Um, uh, what do? You, what's the plan for your list of questions and and, uh, and sharing that and, and getting those answers? Well. Right now, our plan is to put together some, some facts and some questions that we feel commission members should be asking of Columbus Police. I said yesterday, we were observers to this commission meeting where the city attorney got up and said all the things that Columbus Police are supposed to be doing. The activists almost fell out of their chairs when they heard there's something called a consensual stop. And they went on and on about what the makeup of a consensual stop is, meaning an officer 
can just go up and start talking to somebody. And if that citizen doesn't want to talk to that officer, they can just walk away. And everyone just, you know, it was like, come on. If you're a certain person in a certain neighborhood and an officer walks up to you and starts talking, you're not going to walk away. And if you do, you could get arrested or whatever. So we just, we're trying to bridge what Columbus police say they do with what they do. So that's our strategy right now. And you may want to remind them that in 2002, Columbus entered into a voluntary settlement agreement with the Justice Department. Yeah. At the same time, Cleveland did, uh, and neither of those resulted in any meaningful reforms, which is why Cleveland's now under a consent decree. Cincinnati was under a, a what tantamount to a consent decree, but Columbus escaped that type of scrutiny. And it'd be interesting to go back and look at the actual terms of the voluntary settlement agreement, which I suspect. Uh, have never been implemented uh, and give some heft to the fact that they have work to do. Yeah, one, one of the things that we would like to put together is sort of a history of showing, you know, various, um, just, just the history of policing in Columbus as much as we can, and definitely including that settlement. One of the rubs to that is that the chair of this commission is Janet Jackson. She's a former judge and she was the city attorney that defended the city of, she's now retired. She defended the city of Columbus at that time in 2002. Mm -hmm. And so she's got an, an awkward spot to be in because if she claims they're not doing it, that's not good for her. Uh, she has shown some willingness, I think, to look for the truth but I would call her an African-American leader in Columbus who has a lot to lose if she doesn't uh, play nice with the police. But anyway, that's where we're at. Well, good work. This is Harvey. I can kind of tell you currently what we're doing in Des Moines. We're about five years in to organized projects around racial profiling. The, uh, we just finished a series of circle meetings that were organized by the Des Moines Human Rights Commission, uh, a new executive director there, which came out of the Obama administration 21st century policing report and a Kettering Institute model on how to run a community circle like that. Uh, most of us who participated in the circle think it didn't do very well for a number of reasons. Uh, the, but and I don't need to go deeply into it unless you ask questions about it. The next thing up uh, is a series of meetings in a community-based activist organization over the summer. They have a commitment from three members of the Des Moines City Council to attend each of those sessions, and we're in the process of structuring each ses session in a way so that it will combine uh, some storytelling with as well as uh, factual deliveries. And this will, uh, all the council members are white and the participation in these meetings will be, if not totally black, uh, primarily black. Uh, I've described to you before that I've issued Freedom of Information Act requests. The uh, city of Des Moines is resisting those. I've hired an attorney to file litigation for a motion to compel, which ought to be interesting. Uh, I've got them filed against the Polk County Sheriff I've been getting information from the Iowa Department of Transportation, which has provided it without any problem at all. So we've got 16,600 records on traffic stops that I have a young law clerk uh, helping me with this summer to aggregate and, and analyze that data. And we have help up from the state of Iowa. Iowa uses a track, what's called a track system of recording stops and, uh, and arrests. Um, and there's about 26,000 records in that. We've got the first round of information from it. So, you know, we're in the middle of basically trying to find ways to create leverage. The law firm I described before, our willing, um, the community activist organization I described have continued a racial profiling project that's been ongoing for about five years. 
and they are now, what we're now doing is interviewing people who've been profiled. To the extent we can file a complaint, we're filing complaints with the police department on every one of them. And then the attorney that's willing to take these on, if we, re, if we indicate, believe that there is some viable litigation, even if not particularly lucrative at the time, are willing to take these on in small cases. So we're doing a lot of work uh, with it. The, uh, the pushback from the police department just always surprises the hell out of me, but that's the, that's the reality of it. The one thing that will kick up again, we have done restorative based community circles with police. And we also, uh, another of the community based organizations I work with has um, did a juvenile court diversion program with the police as partners. Uh, we've just gotten some legislative fix in that so that we can pick that up again. So as I said, we got a lot of activity, but a police chief who has no interest uh, in any practical sense, apparently on changing practices and procedures, we'll keep you posted. Well, what about this uh, Human Relations Commission uh, circle meetings? Uh, that sounded like something that Professor Rulin was recommending that people you know, try to promote more direct dialogue. And you're saying that uh, it didn't work. What, what was the problem? Well, one of them was the facilitator, uh, who I think thought he was a better facilitator than he turned out to be. Um, I, I got, they, they set up 10 meetings with 16 people each in them. And those were to some extent by invitation. So it included a cross section of the community I got invited to the first of them, which included the police chief, the county attorney, and a bunch of people at that level, including council members. And the tricky part of it was most of the white community that was there, and it was primarily white, hadn't done any of the background work necessary to even understand there is a problem, at least that's the appearance. And what the facilitator ended up doing, which was a violation of his own law, of the Kettering model and his own guidelines, was any time something critical of the police department would be said in that circle, he allowed the police chief to jump in and respond. Uh, so you had a 90 minute meeting, uh, I guess two hours, I'm sorry, where what ended up on it was, was simply mush. And I can see where it would help if we did a series of those, but that's not in the plan right now. We'll, I'll certainly go back to him and describe, maybe we wanna do more of these. I think the model was okay, Al. I just think, don't think it was executed well in the preparation. There needed to be much better preparation for the people attending. And did this diversion program uh, make some progress? Yeah. Before the legislature stopped us, which happened in 2016, and that's the legislation I talked about where we can reinstate it, uh, we handled, um, we, we got reference from the police department for three cohorts of uh, 14, 14 families each, or juveniles. Um, the, our part of that program, we had only one recidivism out of the 43 cases we handled. So the police, the police department speaks highly of that uh, and our participation in it. And it was a good deal both ways because we took low level cases off their desk, things they didn't necessarily wanna have to deal with. And we had a lot more thorough program in terms of what we were doing with the young people and the families than the police department did. So it's, it's very successful. My anticipation is we will be back in business in a couple of months. And it created good relationships between those of us who were doing it and, you know, and the people in the department that we were working with. And did that promote a lot of cross-cultural and uh, cross-racial uh, engagement? Ooh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. If it means did we go out and have beer together, the answer is no. So did the um, black groups that are feeling oppressed, did they get engaged in that program? Absolutely. I mean, part of what we've done in the, in the circle and the mediation programs that we've set up in this last five years is we have consciously recruited people of color uh, both Hispanic and black, brown and black, uh, as facilitators, mediators, and circle keepers. 
And so, um, you know, there's more white, more retired white people doing it than there are black people and brown. But proportionately, there are, uh, proportionate to our population in Des Moines, there are more people of color in, involved in the work. That was a critical part of everything we're doing. We figure that if we don't have the black community leading in this work, we're not going anywhere with it. Well, it sounds productive. Well, some days it feels that and some days it doesn't, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> So prior to the webinar, I got a list of questions from Catherine out of Portland. Are you on the, are you here, Catherine? Yeah, you are. Would you like to uh, ask some of those? Are some of those still with you or? Some of them are still with us. Some of them we've begun to discover the answers locally. But why don't I just briefly tell you what we've been doing and then I'll read those questions in case they interest others and, and because we don't have complete answers to them. Sure. Um, last time I said that we were working on um, on identifying community-based organizations potentially to partner with and that we had planned interviews with six or eight of them. And so between webinars, we've worked on that. Um, we've had telephone or in-personal interviews with representatives of a variety of community organizations. I think earlier in the webinar, one of you referred to um, knowing how to choose community partners. And if you have more to add about that, I think that would be of interest to us. We're really fortunate in that our, in our city, we have a wide variety and a large number of community groups. Um, so choosing is, is an interesting topic of conversation for us, I think. Once we get beyond the fact that, of course, we want to partner with people who represent communities that are most impacted by policing in our city. Um, as we've worked, we've kind of gravitated toward the, um, the entry point in the policing system, um, in the uh, law enforcement system, particularly with respect to kind of low level offenses, um, police practices that seem to scoop up a whole lot of people disproportionately. So we've met, for example, with a group um, that's working um, to um, improve the practices of our Tri-County Transit District, which was um, um, creating a lot of problems for people disproportionately, people of color that had to do with such things as just not having, what, a dollar sixty or something on a particular day, that ultimately could get you a, a Class A misdemeanor and a police record. So those, that's one group we're working with. Um, We've also interviewed some people who represent a diversion programs uh, and um, that's just begun, I think, or isn't very old. And so one of the things we're interested in is who gets access to those. And ultimately just, um, as I said in one of my questions, what are the steps from the initial stop or search or the initial whatever to the point in time when you necessarily have a police record and may even be facing incarceration? And, and what are what kind of profiling and discrimination goes in there um, and how those practices could be um, improved so the number of people of color in particular who, who, who get all the way to that gate to a, ultimately to a prison can be reduced so that that system is more fair and more accessible to people. Um, is there anything anybody would like to add? There are four of us here around one table and as you know, two computers. <laughs> and, and Jen. Remotely. And one other, there are five of us in the webinar today. Um, would you like to add anything? I, on the, um, here, should we? Yeah, so Jen is going to, or excuse me, Dana is going to add something. We're going to try to coordinate our, um, our sound system. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, with uh, what Catherine was just talking about with the community organization that's doing the transit rider project, one of the things that we discovered after having done um, more research on Portland Police Bureau, um, we learned with the transit system that there are 65 police officers from 15 different jurisdictions. And the work that that organization is doing is really a great model in terms of holding listening sessions with 
mm -hmm. transit riders, holding listening sessions with operators, um, and talking to police. And they're, they're working on trying to get a community advocacy uh, rider program going again. Um, but they're, the question of accountability between the fare enforcers mm -hmm. and the police officers and the tri TriMet, which is the contracting agency, and then these 15 different jurisdictions with completely different training, you know, and, and accountability systems. It's really um, a mess. And right now, that wasn't stated as one of their priorities um, to, to, I mean, it's not at the top of the list of things that they want to look at, but there could be a toehold there for us around mm -hmm. um, uh, helping to advocate around the accountability question. Um, so. mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to respond to uh, the issue of choosing your community partner. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, hold on. Go ahead. oh, sorry. We were we were all muted. Could you? <laughs> our speakers were muted. Could you say whatever you just said? Me or, Me or whoever responded after I stopped talking. All right. All right. So. Um, question came up, how do you choose your community partner? And I think that's an important uh, step along the way here to be deliberate about. There are organizations and groups that are extremely angry and ready to, you know, block the highway and, and you know, have an important message to carry forward and much of the content of their message I agree with, uh, but as a lawyer who always tries to build something out of chaos, um, I haven't been able to connect much with groups who want to who want to end their advocacy with protests. And uh, I think it's worth making sure that you're connecting with somebody who wants to build something constructive. And uh, collaborating with the enemy is uh, may be the view some people take of trying to work with the police to engage in evidence-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, programs and so on. Um, but I, I just think it, you have to be a w eyes wide open and make sure that if you're going to invest time, uh, that you've got some partners here who understand the importance of working with the police and are open to uh, seeking reform where both the community and the police are engaged. And uh, that isn't always obvious. There are plenty of people out there who just think that's, um, they can't go there, that it's just too uh, outrageous to try and work that intimately with the police. It gives them too much legitimacy. And you better know that that's, who you're talking to or else you're going to waste your time. This is Jennifer. I just want to add that um, in my past experience working on food justice issues, the groups that are more aggressive, I haven't worked with directly, but I found that they've been useful to push the conversation and to push the issue into the public. Um, so I would want to say, stay out of their way and let them do what they do and then work as to be the bridge where you can um, because I think those groups do have a role to play that's really important but they're probably not going to be the group that sits down with the police and comes up with a solution but you should listen to them and what their concerns are because they're still relevant even if they're going to piss people off too much to sit down per se. That's that good. Makes sense. No, it's very good. Any other of these questions uh, that you want? Yeah, so, um, a lot, so some of the issues that you identified um, in your work in Portland, uh, I'm glad to hear that you are figuring out the answers there. And I hope that what we've provided you is some avenues to get those answers and some understanding of how you can get those answers because like, for example, you raised um, diversion, and there are many different diversion programs in many different jurisdictions, and even within one uh, court system, there could be 
a number of different diversion programs, such as um, you get diversion before you ever enter a plea. So you never enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. Um, and you go through a diversion program, usually this is for misdemeanors, and your charges are then dismissed at the end of it. Um, and uh, you can get your record expunged. Another is diversion at the end uh, or after you enter a plea that prevents you from uh, having to serve time uh, in, in jail or prison. And in those, you get a record. The charges don't get dismissed. But another part of this and why the entry point is so important is that even if the charges get dismissed against you, there's usually a record of it, a public record on the court uh, website. And it'll show that charges were uh, filed against you and that they were dismissed. And so if your landlord or your employer just looks at this public uh, court docket, they'll see you had some involvement and got arrested and, and there was something that happened and maybe you had drugs, maybe you didn't have drugs. And so, that in itself is why uh, the work on uh, reducing arrests uh, is so important because there's collateral consequences even if you don't get um, convicted or plead any. Were there other specific aspects of those questions that um, you'd like us to speak to, Portland? <laughs> Sorry. Um, no. <laughs> I think we're good for now. Thank you. Sounds like we're from outer space. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, what about the folks in Dayton, Miami Valley? Uh, this is Alice. I'll start and then ask Lynn if she wants to chime in. She had an interesting interview, but the two busiest people on the planet are the ones in this <laughs> group. So we are quite far behind um, in our interviews. And we had uh, decided to look at our Montgomery County Jail, which has a pretty notorious record uh, for um, prisoner treatment of prisoners. And in addition, the jail is concerned because about 30% of the people who are inmates have a mental illness that uh, is not, because we don't have adequate uh, treatment in Dayton for mental illness. So, so I know they have concerns about um, the prison as well, but they're, uh, I know you all are working on this too with Montgomery County, but um, we're, we have a team of four and we're, uh, just overloaded, I think, so we're not as far along as we would like to be. Lynn, do you want to talk about the interview you had, if you're there? And you're muted. Yeah. You're unmuted. But I can't hear you, Lynn. Now you're muted again. <laughs> Well, I'll say I'm glad that, um, wait, wait. are you there, Lynn? Well, I'm glad that you're focusing on uh, Montgomery County Jail. Hey, now am I unmuted? Oh, ah, there you are. Welcome back. I'm sorry. So um, I think calling it an interview is a little bit um, grand, but um, I think it also um, is a lesson as well. So it, what it turns out is that just um, after an event that had nothing to do with racist policing, well, it was a gun violence town hall, I ran into someone I've known for many, many years. And so I think the lesson here is the importance of these personal connections that you, that you may or may not have. Um, and this person is an RN, and she's been attending all of the um, meetings of the task force, which has been slowly at glacial speed, supposedly addressing um, the issues in the Montgomery County Jail. So she's someone I've known for years, but I didn't know that she had this involvement. It's called the Montgomery Jail Justice Advisory Committee. She asked to be on it. She was not one of the people chosen. 
Um, it also happens that her husband is close to someone who worked at the jail for quite a long time. So they are both usually informed about this issue um, and, you know, are basically a really great resource. I mean, I could say more about what they said, um, but um, she said she would be willing to meet with us. This was a few weeks ago and, you know, we have not yet moved to meet with her. Um, I guess one thing to pass on, um, and she is on a, even though she's not on the committee, I said she's been attending the meetings. She is also um, on one of the subcommittees that I guess they allowed her to be on. <laughs> and um, she's white and her husband is black. And um, that enters into, I think, the fact that her husband knows um, a lot about racial dynamics at the jail because of his close relationship with someone who worked there for many years. But um, they just had a lot to say and they kind of turned um, our view of one thing on its head. I don't know if their take is correct. Um, I don't know. I think it, I, I, maybe I've said enough, um, except to add that I did ask the question. We, we had a long conversation just informally after an event. That's why I said it wasn't really an interview. Um, I did ask her, you know, I told her that I was involved in this group and I said, what do you think would be a role for people like us if we could get some people together? You know, what would be something to do? Cause she's clearly very critical of what's going on and very frustrated with the slowness of the justice advisory committee. And she said, really, if you could just organize a bunch of people and get them to start coming to the meetings and say, you guys are moving too slow and we want action to show public concern. And that does seem to me that something that could be doable by us um, down the road. That's it. Yeah, thank you. And also listening to the conversation today, I know we, uh, Lynn and I both know people on the uh, HRC here in Dayton. And, uh, so maybe if we could bring her in and uh, Amaha or someone like that, we might get a stronger partnership. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that Lynn made about getting people, physical bodies to some of these meetings. You know, it, it is an indication that there's a problem that needs attention when a politician sets up either the Columbus reform group or the Miami Valley reform group, but that's as far as they want to go. I mean, they want to say that they had a meeting and they had heard everybody and now they want to go back behind the curtain and, and do what they were always doing. So it does take follow through and it does take uh, an organized group to keep pressing. And, and if there is uh, that meeting of the problem with some people with a vested interest, uh, that could be a very good uh, use of your time uh, and, and a very important service to the broader community. Uh, certainly the Montgomery County Jail is worthy of everyone's attention since so many people get hurt. And yeah, and I would just add to that that, that this person and her husband said that um, that the incidents that have been in the news with the lawsuits, they said they happen there all the time. They said that's just the norm. And they talked about some particular dynamics that resulted in those particular incidents being um, the ones that ended up being made public, including some racial aspects to it. Um, but their take was that's just normal. That's just normal in, in that jail. I, I'm talking about things like the uh, pepper spraying of a woman in a restrained chair. So, yeah, well, it, you know, if, if there's no other takeaway from this webinar, it should be that uh, conduct like that should never be tolerated as normal. If it is normal, then we need to stand up and name it as outrageous and not let people get complacent around that type of behavior. And to go back to something Harvey said, uh, there are lawyers out there willing to sue over that stuff. And it can be part of the strategy, the broader community organizing strategy, to make sure that people are held accountable when they do outrageous things. And, and some of you are, like uh, uh, what, what Lynn just said, you're learning that outrageous things are uh, all too common and, and we shouldn't tolerate it. I have a follow-up question on that. Several of us are involved in the statewide 
uh, ballot initiative to uh, called Safe and Healthy Ohio to change fourth and fifth degree felonies for drug possession only to misdemeanors. And um, when I asked somebody to sign my petition, they said, well, that, that's going to mean a lot more people are going to go to jails and not prisons. And prisons are, are in some cases a lot better managed than county jails and city jails. And what about all these people going to these nasty jails? Do you have any comments about that? Is there anything? I mean, I feel like there's so many fires to be put out, but you know, I don't want to be putting more people in nasty county and city jails. Yeah, so uh, that's a really good point. And this ballot initiative that's in Ohio is one that's being shopped around to other states as well. And it's an effort to, uh, to reduce the prison population by reducing the level of the crime that will trigger a prison stay. But you're right, it could just result then if a judge is, is determined or if the sentencing scheme uh, is determined to uh, cause a, a loss of, of freedom uh, to just send people to jail. There is a way around that. Our juvenile system has a model that I would highly recommend to any state. I was involved in litigation to reduce the number of kids that are locked up. And at the state level, we had like 2,500 kids in eight institutions when we started. Now we have 450 in three institutions. But what we did along the way is we insisted that the money that was being spent on all those institutions and that was hardening these young people as criminals be pooled and return to the local community so that there's a system called reclaim that allows a local judge uh, to because juvenile judges have more power to and, and creativity and sentencing than adult judges do but it allows a judge who doesn't send a kid to the state to take the money that would have gone to the state and use it for local programming and there's a there's a, uh, a condition on that money and that is that the judge can only use it in evidence-based programs. So early on when we started this, uh, one judge wanted to run a juvenile boot camp and he was not permitted to do that because it's very clear that boot camps don't work to deter anyone from criminal behavior and they just aren't a healthy and reasonable way to treat kids. So it was nice to be able to create a system that both promoted evidence-based sentencing and kept kids local and kept them out of confinement uh, while uh, addressing you know, uh, aberrant behavior that they had engaged in. We don't have that type of system for adults, and we should, because it would answer, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't have to lock somebody up for a fourth degree felony. Uh, there ought to be other options. There should be a consequence. I mean, that's just normal behavior that there should be a consequence, but we need more uh, options available. We have some, you know, we have the things Adam was talking about, these diversion, there's a mental health court, there's uh, different types of programming for people with specific needs and now there's veterans courts, uh, but there should be uh, even more uh, community-based programming available as the alternative uh, to just locking people in jails, because that is dangerous. Adam and I are doing a case in Kentucky right now where the jail, help me with the numbers, the local, the local inmates were like a minority. Yeah, so the jail has like 380 inmates and only 70 of them are local people and the rest, the state is, um, is shipping over there and paying 30, 40 bucks a day per head to the local jail. So it's being run as a profit enterprise. Yeah, it's crazy. They're just filling up their beds with state inmates. And this is because Kentucky systemically set up a system where they allow this to happen, where the State Department of Corrections doesn't have to house everybody. But for fourth degree felons, they can send them off to local institutions and, and pay them. Right, so I think it's a valid concern, but it shouldn't stop us from trying to depopulate the prisons. It just should make sure that we don't play a shell game. And are the Ohio prisons privatized? 
there are 33 Ohio prisons. There are no completely private prisons. There are like three that are under contract so that they're managed by private companies, but the rest are all state run and state owned. And they're all state owned, but, the re but there are three that are, that are run by a private company under contract. And do you think, the, um, is that gonna stay that way? There was some talk about Kasich or somebody wanting to privatize Ohio prison. Is that really still in the hopper? Not really, not at the present time. I think people are all frustrated that uh, when Kasich came in, uh, the Ohio governor, and when uh, the current director of the Department of Corrections came in, there, there was a commitment publicly stated to depopulate the prisons. They were at 50,000. When he came in, they're still at 50,000. So it's uh, been very frustrating. Thank you. So I think we've covered all the groups uh, for now. I think uh, Kevin and Meg and I will uh, get together and, and probably poll the group about ongoing meetings. But before we uh, adjourn uh, this webinar, I did want to ask one question of Al, my dad. So somebody, I don't know if he's ever shared this, but his police reform work is volunteer as well. So he hasn't been paid for all of his work with the uh, collaborative since uh, since they settled the lawsuit, you know, over 10 years ago, and well over 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But he has been at the table and involved for those last 15 years as a volunteer. And since we have a whole group of volunteers here who, are, who have been out doing this work for some time or setting off on what could be a very long journey, the question is, what keeps you going? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I certainly, having relationships with people like Iris, having relationships with people like Maris, um, so that you have both police professionals and community activists with a vision that's shared uh, and goals that are shared, uh, gives you energy to keep it going. You know that what we're working on is the right thing. You know that if we don't do this, more people will be you know, uh, killed, more people will be unfairly arrested, more people will be locked up. Um, and it goes back to something I was talking about earlier. It's quite remarkable how much injustice we've gotten used to. And uh, having those types of people around Help, help you remember that we do not live in a fair society and it's up to us who have privilege to do something about that. So I, I just hope that uh, we've helped encourage more of that type of work. As you can see, it's not simple, but it's certainly necessary. Well, thank you for everything you've done. My God, I just, I just I, I've only been at this about five or six years, and I can't imagine some of my black activist friends that I'm developing who've been at this their whole lives, lost family members, lost children, lost aunts and uncles and cousins, and the devastation and the trauma. And I, yesterday I, at this commission meeting, one of those people was on the commission table, and she said, I got to tell you, I was checking myself the whole time because I just wanted to leap out of my chair. And I knew if I leap out of my chair, they're going to kick me off this commission. It just uh, so thank you for everything you've done for the state of Ohio and the U.S. the U.S. of A. the good old U.S. of A. where everybody lives free, right? Yeah, but you can't take a knee if you're in the NFL now. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for all the work you're you're doing as well. I think you know a colleague, uh, 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 leaks. Um, she's a civil rights, a retired civil rights attorney in Cincinnati, I think, uh, Lisa, oh, Lisa Meeks. Yeah, Lisa Meeks, right. She's a great friend. Yeah, yeah. She, is she retired from civil rights? Right, she's doing uh, development work, uh, re rehabbing houses. Hiring felons. That's right. That's, uh, see, she's contributing in that way. That's right. That's good. Anyways. Any other questions or things that people would like to share um, and before we turn the
page to the next chapter. Well, it's been very impressive to, uh, to learn of all the work you're putting in and everything you're learning um, and uh, to help be a bit of a resource in that, in that journey. Um, I know it's an ongoing thing and we'll continue to, to be in touch and figure out how we can, can, can continue to support you. Uh, but good work. You guys have been working hard. It's really impressive. So um, you're doing good things for your communities. Before you end, I thought it would be nice for people to just take a go around and say thank you to you guys. Um, because as was just said, I think that um, it's really inspiring how long you've been doing this and, and all the ways that you keep learning and changing and bringing different partners in and, and respecting and listening to them and learning from them as we, as we do. So thank you so much. I've learned, an, I've learned a lot, and even though we're behind, I know the lessons that we've learned so far are carrying us forward, and I very much appreciate it and hope we can continue to work together. I know we'll keep working. Um, okay. Systems that are just keeping. And thank you very much for all the work and the people you brought in. I feel like I've learned a lot. It's been going to be very helpful with us. And we in Portland uh, want to thank you not only for the expertise, but um, especially what you just shared at the end, that constant reminder of why we're doing this. And the, um, it's meaningful that this is through our Unitarian Universalist connection. And um, uh, the question was asked is if we would like to continue. I know we would. Um, it's, it's a nice anchor for us to be able to ask questions, but also to kind of be in that circle of, of mutual um, purpose. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Adam and Al. This is from those of us in Columbus. Um, yeah, your work is really inspiring and it's just wonderful to um, hear uh, from your wisdom and your experience and especially from uh, the other partners that you brought in. Um, it's been really wonderful. And yeah, I, we would also certainly love for these webinars to continue in some form. Uh, and I agree, it's, it's a good anchoring sort of place. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. There are a couple of new groups who have expressed interest in coming in. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking behind the scenes and getting back to everyone. I want to also lift up thanks to Kevin, who's been holding this thing together. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Making it look easy, but when it goes badly there, the whole thing goes down. So <laughs> <laughs> really matters a lot. So thank you Great. to everybody. I do have one question. Can you comment on